Okay, hello everybody. So I, I guess we'll start. So I have uh, some good news and some bad news. Okay, so the, ba the bad news is I didn't have time yet this year to turn these slides into English. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I can read the disappointment on your faces. Okay, so please, please, no official complaints. I'm very sorry about this. So that, that's the bad news. And uh, the, the good news is that I just checked with the timetable office, and in fact, we can stay in the same room for the second uh, session because it didn't really make any sense for us all to move and go in another room. So, so we're staying here. Now... What we have to do this afternoon is go through some kind of very basic standard microbiology. Okay, what are the con and, and you know what are the conditions for microbial growth and how can you grow my bac my bacteria in the lab? And I kind of regret the last lecture because just afterwards I thought, no, it would have been much better if I'd done these two first and then done the lecture on identification afterwards. So, well, next year it will be like that. Um, okay, so th th this comes under the heading of something everybody has to do, okay? Anybody who studies microbiology has to know this stuff. So we're going to start out with, you know, what do bacteria need? What are the nutritional types of bacteria? Then how we can, uh, what, what different types of media there are to culture and isolate bacteria. Then we're going to go through, you know, how do we measure bacterial growth? What is continuous culture and what is closed culture or batch culture? And then the first half of the course kind of finishes with uh, bacterial growth on a surface. So all, the, all of this stuff, you know, uh, growth curve and batch culture, these are bacteria growing in a liquid. And biofilms are when bacteria grow on a surface. And you'll find out that this only occurs when bacteria grow to a certain number. And the question is, how do they know? How do they know how many bacteria are, are there at a particular time? So that's what this is about, quorum sensing. And then the second part is going to be going through these physical, chemical uh, parameters that influence bacterial growth. So probably we'll break up somewhere like have a break after about uh, section four here and then from five to eleven will be the the second the next part okay so uh, nutritional requirements for bacteria pretty much this uh, the same as for anything that is any living organism we all need carbon nitrogen phosphorus sulfur and a bunch of uh, metals and uh, minerals. So we are gonna, we're going to go through these one by one. Carbon requirements for bacteria. Many bacteria require some form of organic carbon. Sugars, peptides, fatty acids. And all of these bacteria which require complex organic carbon are called heterotrophs. Whereas those bacteria that can make all of the structures in a cell just from a simple inorganic source of carbon are autotrophs. For example, cyanobacteria, photosynthetic bacteria, only require carbon dioxide, the carbon source. Um, there are bacteria that can grow just on something like methane or for formic acid. So these are uh, carbon molecules which, you know, chemically you would define as being organic, right? However, I think it's probably correct to qualify 
methanotrophic bacteria that can produce everything just from a source of methane as autotrophs because they can synthesize you know, sugars, fatty acids, uh, proteins, nucleotide bases, just from a simple source beginning with one carbon. Okay, so carbon dioxide is a classical example, but I would also call, you know, bacteria that can grow just with methane or just with formic acid as autotrophs. Nitrogen, okay, it's the same kind of thing. There are bacteria that require an organic source of nitrogen, either in the form of peptides or uh, nucleotide bases. But many bacteria can uh, make do with inorganic sources of nitrogen. So uh, the easiest one to incorporate is reduced nitrogen. So uh, ammonium compounds, ammonia or ammonium salts, and the first step is adding this ammonium group to uh, create amino acids. And then it can be transferred to make uh, other components. If no ammonium is present, but nitrate is present, many bacteria can perform assimilatory nitrate reduction. So nitrate, of course, is an oxidized form of nitrogen and bacteria will have to expand energy to add electrons onto the nitrogen here to transform it into reduced nitrogen. And then this can be assimilated into amino acid. Many bacteria can do that. So, uh, you know, uh, ammonium salts or nitrate salts can be added into a culture medium and many bacteria can use that for all of their needs of, uh, of, of nitrogen. And lastly, but certainly not least, uh, there are some bacteria which can actually reduce nitrogen gas into ammonium. So, of course, cyanobacteria, photosynthetic bacteria can do this, and also the symbiotic bacteria that live in the root nodules of leguminous plants. This is an extremely important chemical reaction, or type of biochemistry, biochemical pathway, because it you know, gives us food to eat. And I don't know if you really realize how difficult this is to do chemically, okay? You know, does anybody know the chemical process by which this occurs in industrial chemistry to produce fertilizers? Yeah, I asked the two lecture halls yesterday about this, and nobody knew there either. So the harbor process, anybody know, heard of that? OK. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know if, well, I, I'm not well, <laughs> OK, I'll go ahead with this. So I don't know if it's just because we're here in France and you don't like German stuff or whatever. But you know, this is an extremely important re synthetic reaction. So it's combining uh, nitrogen gas with hydrogen okay, to produce ammonium. And it's extremely important to produce chemical fertilizer. Okay? The only reason we can feed so many people on the planet or have such a productive agriculture in France is because of this reaction. Okay? And if you want to do that uh, chemically, you've got to have a huge reaction chamber with massive pressure and very high temperature and an iron catalyst. You need to put a ton of energy into this reaction to make it go because nitrogen gas is extremely chemically stable. So this reaction is you know, quite a feat that bacteria can perform this. You know, just, just on, on the subject of the harbor process because basically uh, I think these two lectures will perhaps not take up two hours and 40 minutes exactly. So I have a little bit of time for the anecdote about the harbor process. Now, this, this is the reason why the First World War lasted so long, you know, okay? Um, one of the big problems that Germany had in the First World War is that they were reliant on imports of uh, mineral nitrates, okay, for their agriculture. And the British Navy was able to put a naval blockade all around Germany and stop the imports coming in. 
So they couldn't grow enough food to feed their population and carry on fighting. So this is where Fritz Haber um, was uh, uh, stepped in here and invented his process in, I think, 1915. And this was able to, you know, allow, uh, uh, you know, imperial First World War Germans to carry on fighting for so long. So it was really a very important process, chemical process, for, for world history. Um, yeah, an interesting story about him and his wife as well, actually. So I, I recommend you to have a little look about uh, uh, Harbour and his wife and uh, how she met her end. Okay. Um, uh, getting back to the subject, uh, phosphorus and sulfur are, of course, uh, requirements for many biomolecules. So phosphorus for nucleotides, DNA, and RNA. Now, of course, if these are hanging around in an organic form outside bacteria, they can take them up and use them immediately. Most of the time, they won't be very much free, you know, ATP outside of uh, bacterial cells. And most bacteria can, of course, make use of inorganic phosphate and just stick it onto uh, a, a nucleotide monophosphate, diphosphate with kinase. So inorganic phosphate easily taken up and incorporated into bacteria. Often one of the limiting factors for bacterial growth. Sulfur, okay, uh, once again it's necessary for the sulfur containing amino acids and if these amino acids are present in the culture then they can be uh, incorporated or they can be taken up by bacteria. Otherwise inorganic forms. It's a little bit like nitrogen because the easiest form to assimilate is hydrogen sulfide, the reduced form. And if only sulfate is present, then bacteria have to expend energy, reduce sulfate to sulfide, and then incorporate that into, I think, cysteine first. Okay, so far so good. And then all bacteria will require mineral salts. So large, relatively high concentrations of sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and uh, chloride will be required just to maintain the osmotic characteristics of the cytosol. Okay, magnesium, okay, it's a cofactor for many enzymes, but it's also required to complex uh, nucleotide triphosphates. And as well as that, bacteria will require a bunch of oligoelements, other metals, generally, generally required in much lower concentrations than uh, these ions. So manganese, cobalt, uh, uh, and, and a few others are cofactors for certain enzymes. Iron is a little bit of an exception here. It's uh, an oligoelement, but it's, you really need much more iron than you need cobalt or manganese. That's because many enzymes involved in electron transport, in particular for respiration, these enzymes have iron 2 to iron 3 transition as you know, it's kind of the, 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 the engine room of the enzyme that allows electrons to be transferred from one molecule to another. And these and this, this, this iron is present either in iron sulfur complexes or as a heme group, like in hemoglobin. So all bacteria require a reasonable amount of iron in order to perform basic reactions for their energy metabolism. So you need much more iron than all of the others, all of these here. And kind of the last thing in this list is that uh, so far we have made the assumption that bacteria are able to synthesize everything that they need as long as they have the basic building blocks. Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes bacteria will require some other growth factors in order to be able to grow. So 
So, for example, the vitamin styamine or biotin, B1 and B7, uh, can be required. And you may need to add these cofactors, these growth factors, into the culture. So, what is the function of these molecules? So, these are small organic molecules that are, uh, okay, relatively small compared to, like, a protein, I mean. So these are organic molecules which are, once again, enzyme cofactors for a variety of important, essential chemical reactions. So thiabine is required for two carbon transfers. And biotin is required for one carbon transfers. And there are a lot of these reactions that are essential for cells. So if you can't perform them, you can't live, basically. And this leads me on to the last uh, point here, which is that if bacteria can, in fact, synthesize thiamine, for example, then what you say is that bacteria are prototrophic or prototrophs for thiamine. That means they can synthesize this molecule from basic building blocks. If they can't synthesize thiamine, then they are oxytrophs for thiamine. And this is true for different types of or, you know, essential organic molecules. So bacteria can be oxytrophic for particular amino acids for purine or pyrimidine biosynthesis, or for different growth factors. So, you know, what you need, the basic thing you need to remember about this is that you are prototrophic or autotrophic for a particular type of molecule. Prototroph means the bacterium can synthesize it. Oxytroph, you cannot synthesize whatever it is. So basic terms, and this was very important in determining the genes involved in the biosynthesis of all of these things. Because the very first step in finding out how, how bacteria synthesize, okay, thiamine, for example, is first step, start off with bacteria which are prototrophs for thiamine. They can synthesize it, generate a bunch of mutants, find those mutants that suddenly require thymine, and you think, aha, this mutant has a mutation in a gene that's involved in the biosynthesis of thymine. So the, the way we know so much about uh, you know, biosynthetic pathways, a lot of it was you know, first done by looking for oxytrophic mutants in Escherichia coli, in uh, Bacillus subtilis, and so on. Okay, so this will bring me on to nutritional types. I'm going to write that. So uh, once again, we've got that, that basic terms in microbiology that everybody has to know and understand. And the nutritional types for bacteria are characterized by or are determined by what bacteria use as their source of energy. So it's light for photosynthetic bacteria or chemicals for the others. So these bacteria will be called phototrophic, phototrophs and chemotrophs. The source of electrons used to uh, produce, you know, reduced biochemical molecules. Okay, so fatty acids. Okay, everybody needs to synthesize fatty acids for the membrane. These are reduced molecules. You need to get a source of electrons to synthesize them. So this can either be organic sources of electrons, in which case these bacteria are called organotrophs, or it can be inorganic, in which case bacteria are called lithotrophs. And finally, Everybody needs a source of carbon to build the structures of the cell. It can be organic or inorganic. So as we said before, heterotrophs or autotrophs. 
So there are kind of three characteristics and two categories per characteristic. So there should be eight possibilities, right? Yeah, right. Now I've tried to kind of uh, draw out the eight possibilities here. Okay, so we've got you know phototroph, chemotroph here, organotroph, lithotroph for both of these categories, and then photo, organo, autotroph, heterotroph, etc. So these are the eight categories that should be possible. Now what do they mean? Okay, so photo, litho, autotrophs. So these are photosynthetic bacteria which use an inorganic source of carbon and use some kind of mineral as a source of electrons for their energy metabolism. So you get cyanobacteria and purple and green sulfur bacteria, different types of photosynthetic bacteria here. Now there are also photo-organo-heterotrophic bacteria. So these bacteria are photosynthetic, but they are but they require organic carbon for their biosynthetic pathways and as a source of electrons. Now, you might wonder, why, why are these like, uh, well, I, I don't know about you, but I, I wondered about this. Why, why are these, uh, uh, these cells in the table empty? Okay, why don't you find any photo-organo autotrophic bacteria. Okay, think about it for a little bit. <laughs> why don't these things exist and why don't these things exist? Well, Okay, if you were a photo-organo-autotroph, okay, you're photosynthetic, but you're going to use an organic source of electrons, so sugar, peptides, something like this, but then you're going to use an inorganic source of carbon to produce your biomolecule. That, that doesn't really make any sense, because if you're an organotroph, that means that organic carbon is already available. You have already got like sugar somewhere, for example. So it doesn't make any sense to also produce sugar out of carbon dioxide. It's just a waste of time because it's already there. That's also true for, for this category, isn't it? Because if you could imagine something that's a photo litho heterotroph. So if you're a heterotroph, then you've already got organic carbon. So you've got you know, a, a, a another source of electrons that's available that's easier to use. So, it, you know, there's no real point in uh, spending a, a lot of time performing complex biochemistry just to get a few electrons from a rock. Okay? So, I mean, the, the, these categories are perhaps theoretically possible. I could imagine, you know, how it will, how it will work but they don't really exist because the bacteria that performed these kinds of, uh, you know, that lived like this, they would just be very inefficient. And so they, they, they've been outcompeted if they ever existed before. So for chemotrophs, it's the same kind of thing, okay? So uh, probably most bacteria are chemo-organo-heterotrophs. Uh, they require organic carbon for... Uh, their, their source of energy, source of electrons, and for the building blocks for their uh, for producing structures of the cell. Chemo organo autotrophs don't exist. Wouldn't make any sense. Now there are also chemo litho autotrophs. So these bacteria are very weird. Okay, these ones you can kind of, you can understand them. They're photosynthetic. They're like plants. Okay, they get energy from the sun, they make, they use it to produce uh, organic carbon. Okay, we understand what's going on here. Heterotrophs, you know, chemo-organic, organo-heterotrophs, they're like animals, okay? They eat carbon, or re uh, organic carbon that at, at some point has been produced by these guys. 
However, uh, chemolithoautotrophs only exist among the bacteria. So these are bacteria that can extract energy from an inorganic chemical reaction, and they can get electrons and energy from this inorganic chemical source, and this will allow them to fix carbon dioxide and produce organic carbon molecules. So th these bacteria do, do really do amazing things. They're, they're living almost on nothing, right? They just live on a, on a rock or something. Okay, so some examples. So uh, cyanobacteria like anabina. So this is a photolithoautotroph. Nitrosomonas, uh, a chemolithoautotroph. Okay, so it lives by uh, oxidizing ammonia to or ammonium to nitrite. And this is a favorable uh, chemical reaction in the presence of dioxygen, in the presence of oxygen gas. And that's enough to produce energy and to uh, extract electrons from the ammonium, which are going to be reduced, were going to be used to fix carbon dioxide and then reduce it into carbohydrate. And then finally, you know, heterotrophs like E. coli, they need organic material for all of these three things. Okay, so that's enough talking for me from me for, for now, I guess. Uh, so just quickly to make sure people have understood this. Have a look at the characteristics of this bacterium. How would you describe it? Everybody got it? Yeah. So is it A, a photolithro heterotroph, prototroph for biotin? No. Okay. A photolitho autotroph, prototroph for biotin? No. Photolitho autotroph, oxotroph for biotin? Hang on. Some people shook their heads and other people said yes. Now who says yes? Who says no? A couple of people. Some plenty of people don't, okay, well, yeah, or is it a photoorganoheterotroph, oxytroph for biotin? Oh, some people say yes to that as well. Okay, let's go through this. Okay, so the source of carbon is bicarbonate, okay? Carbon dioxide dissolved in water. Inorganic carbon, okay, so it's a, an autotroph. It only grows if you have light, so it's a phototroph of some kind, okay? So definitely got to be a photolithoautotroph. So it's either this one or that one. So the last thing is the biotin, okay? A condition que, so it, you must supplement in biotin. This bacterium cannot make biotin. So that means it's oxotroph for biotin. Okay, so the answer is this one, photolithoautotroph, oxotroph for biotin. Yeah. Okay. Is it likely that this bacterium would be living in a natural environment? Okay, you've got a 50-50 chance here, yes or no? Who says yes? You could find this living in a lake somewhere. Who says no? <laughs> okay, one person. What, why? Why isn't it likely?
not, I'm not, sh I'm not sure I follow the, uh, the, what you're trying to say here, but yeah, come on. What kind of natural environment is this thing going to grow in if it's a photo litho autotroph? Is there going to be a lot of organic carbon around where this thing grows? Probably, probably not, right? Because it's making all of its own organic carbon. So if it's making even the most basic, you know, organic carbon compounds, probably unlikely that it really it has a source of biotin hanging around outside it. Okay, you will only find vitamins, the growth factors like this, around in a very, very rich environment. So if you've got a kind of rich chemical environment anyway. Well, most of the bacteria in that environment will be, you know, heterotrophs. So, you know, so all, most, you know, autotrophs, autotrophic bacteria can produce everything they need, okay, and they won't have a, a requirement for growth factors. But, you know, you might find something like this in a research lab because it's a particular mutant that has been generated. Anyway, so I was kind of thinking about this when I gave the description, and I thought that's a bad idea because this kind of thing will never really exist. But why doesn't, exi doesn't it exist as a, as a natural type of bacterium is also kind of in interesting <coughs> thought experiment, well, at least you know, from my point of view. Okay. So, yeah, I think, I think that's actually generally true. Okay, so bacteria that are growing in a very rich environment where you've got a lot of organic compounds, you know, glucose, peptides, they might lose biosynthetic pathways for some other stuff. Okay, so these ones can have, uh, you know, more particular nutritional requirements than bacteria that live in a very nutrient poor environment because those bacteria have to synthesize everything for themselves. Okay, so what would be an example of an environment for bacteria to grow where there's a lot of complex organic molecules? Can anybody think of an environment like that? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the example from last... Tin of cassowary, yeah, but normally your tin of cassowary doesn't have a lot of bacteria, but once you've eaten the cassowary, right? Yeah, but af after you eat it, where does it go? Yeah, in your gut, okay? So this is an gut bacteria. They grow in an environment which is very, very rich. So, for example, these kind of bacteria may lose some biosynthetic pathways because they've got tons of food all around them. Okay, uh, right, so how do we culture bacteria? Bacteria, normally they're growing in their natural environment, wherever that is, okay? But in order to study them, we have to get them to grow in the laboratory. And there are different types of culture medium that we use to, to do this. So the first type is called a defined medium. It can also be termed a synthetic medium. And in a defined medium, all of the chemical components of the medium are known and, well, precisely defined. So, for example, this is a defined medium. It's got source of organic carbon, and then all the other nutritional requirements are present in inorganic form. So you have phosphate salts, a bit of ammonium, a bit of sulfate, sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, and also some iron. There are no growth factors here, so this kind of medium would also be called minimal medium because it's got the minimum requirements for growth of 
chemo-organoheterotrophs, which are prototrophic. So they can produce all their amino acids, all their nu nucleotide bases, and all their growth factors. Okay, what, what is missing from this list compared to what we said just earlier is essential, an essential nutritional requirement? Yeah. Hmm? Carbon, hey, glucose. We have plenty of carbon in glucose. Yeah? Yeah, there are no vitamins. There are no gro external growth factors. So only prototrophs can grow in this. Okay, bacteria that can synthesize those vitamins themselves. Uh, so it's going to be selective for bacteria which are prototrophic for thiamine, uh, thiatine, and so on. But that's okay. But what else is missing? <laughs> water, water. That, that's funny. That's funny. Hey, come on. What? Uh, you know, liter. Did we have? Okay, it's not. It's not specifically listed, but it's yeah. It's kind of suggested, I guess. Yeah. Uh, true. There is no light, uh, but. Okay, well, if, if, if you're a chemo uh, heterotroph, that shouldn't bother you, right? Because you're using the glucose for energy production. No, seriously, nobody can see, yeah? Nitrogen, we've got ammonium salts. So the nitrogen source is here. Inorganic, hey, well, let's go back and check in that case. It's something on this list. So we don't have in. Yeah, okay, so we've got iron, but there's no like manganese, cobalt, and all this kind of stuff. And the reason for that is you only need a really tiny amount. You're talking about micrograms per ml or something, and that will be enough. And in most cases, when you are ordering the chemicals to make up a defined medium like this, or minimal medium, let me give you a clue here. Uh, if Are you going to go and order the most expensive, high-grade uh, calcium chloride that you can find, or are you going to order the cheapest, ca low-grade calcium chloride that is on the list in the catalog? Who says, whoa, let's spend the money? Nobody who says, no, I'm a cheapskate. Let's save some money. Yeah, good, good. It's the right, it's the right attitude. Yeah, you'll use the cheapest reagent. Okay, so why? What is special about the high grade? Why, why are you know the high grade chemical reagents more expensive? Okay, think about it in terms of alcohol. What is more expensive, uh, a, a liter of whiskey or a liter of beer? <laughs> liter of whiskey, right? Which has got the purest alcohol in it? <laughs> whiskey, right? So the, the more expensive reagent, you know, even for something simple like calcium chloride, right? The more pure it is, the more ex the more money it's going to cost to you know, purify it and, uh, and guarantee and test its purity and all this kind of stuff. So if, if you use the cheap, low-grade reagents, then you'll have trace amounts of other metals in a lot of these compounds, okay? So you don't have to worry about adding in a little tiny bit of cobalt or manganese or molybdenum, which may be required for some enzymes. However, if you're specifically working on research and you want to find out which metals are absolutely essential for bacteria, then you would have to spend as, as much money as you possibly can and buy the purest reagents that you can find and then add back tiny amounts of these uh, oligo elements. Okay? So that, that's why you don't have to actually specify everything. But 
the, the, the main things that bacteria need are all present in this minimal medium. And, you know, the main use of this is that once uh, you've done this, then you can find out what are the precise nutritional needs of the bacterium that you are studying. So if you've got something that grows quite well on a rich medium, you put it into a minimal medium, it doesn't grow, okay, then you can start putting in other things and find out what they need. And you'll learn something from that. So defined media are generally not used for the first isolation of bacteria because you're starting out without any ideas beforehand about what do my bacteria need. You don't actually know to begin with, okay? So the first thing that you're going to use will generally be a complex medium. So in a complex medium, you don't know the precise constitution of the medium. But you kind of hope that everything is everything that is required is in there somehow. So classical example of a complex medium will be a LB medium. So you've got 10 gram per liter of peptones. So you'll have a, and this is a source of uh, peptides. For, so, so you get something rich in protein like meat, uh, soya beans, and then you hydrolyze it up to produce soluble peptides. Yeast extract and a bit of salt. So once again, in the salt here, you're going to have all the uh, oligo elements that you're going to need. In the yeast extract, this is an extract from cells. So you imagine everything that the cell needs is going to be in this extract. Vitamins, uh, you know, nucleotides, fatty acids, something like that. It's all going to be in there. So a medium like this would be pretty good for chemoheterotrophs that are not too fussy. They don't have any particular requirement. So uh, that would be for non-fastidious chemoheterotrophs, a complex medium like LB or Tryptychase soya agar. There's a bunch of them. Muller Hinton. Complex media with ingredients that are very, very cheap and it's going to be simple to make. Now, some bacteria may not grow on a complex medium because they might have some kind of specific nutritional requirement, in which case you might need to grow them on an enriched medium. So this is going to be a complex medium where you add something specific. Okay. So one of them which is used you know, for quite a few bacterial pathogens is a, a fresh blood agar. So here you start off with a triptic, triptic, trip, right, tryptone soya agar, so triptic digestive casein. So you've got short peptides, also from soya, salt, and agar. You mix this up to one liter, put it in the autoclave, boil it up, leave it to cool to 50 degrees before the agar starts to set, and then add uh, 50 ml of uh, sterile sheet blood to the agar and pour the plate. So that's useful for, uh, you know, some quite fussy uh, chemo organoheterotrophs. So listeria, monocytogenes will not grow very well on LB or uh, tryptychosoya agar. Uh, streptococci also like, grow much better on blood agar than uh, basic agar. So you get plates that look like this, okay? So I think this is a uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae on a uh, blood agar plate. Now in some cases, especially if you start with a complex mixture and you know a particular type of bacteria that you are looking for that may be present, then you'll want to use a selective medium. So in a selective medium, you've got a complex medium, and then you add something which is going to inhibit the growth 
of the bacteria you don't want, and possibly some other components which will favor the growth of the bacteria you're interested in. And there are really a lot of these selective media that are in use in clinical biology, in food biology, and you know, lots of them specifically for enriching different types of bacteria. So for example, in the lab classes, you'll be using Chapman uh, agar. So this has got a high concentration of salt. That's about 1.3 molar, 75 grams per liter. And this will be selective for halo-tolerant or halophilic bacteria. Now, what is important, for example, in food biology or medical bio, in food, yeah, food microbiology or medical microbiology, they're going to be Staphylococcus. Staphylococci are halo-tolerant. Now, another way to enrich for Staphylococci is with Baird Parker medium. So here, the selective, the first selective agents are these mineral salts, lithium chloride and tellurite. So tellurium is a metal, and tellurite is toxic for most gram positives and gram negatives. Some bacteria are tellurite resistant and can reduce tellurite to telluride, and they will be able to survive, so including Staphylococci. The second selective element here is the presence of pyruvate and glycine as glucose sources, and these are preferentially used by Staphylococci. So you're going to be selecting only for the bacteria that can survive in the presence of uh, these two salts, and really favoring the growth of Staphylococci here on these plates. So another example is McConkie agar, and this has got bio salts and a basic dye which can inhibit the growth of gram positive. So it's a selective medium for gram negative. Now often selective media are coupled with some kind of component which will allow you to differentiate different types of bacteria that can grow on that medium. So these are called differential media. So Chapman agar is selective for Staphylococci and differential for Staphylococcus aureus because it contains a large amount of mannitol and most Staphylococci that are mannitol positive are Staphylococcus aureus. And so this is a Chapman agar plate with Staphylococcus aureus streaked here. So the red color is phenol red, I think. It's a uh, pH indicator. So Staphylococcus aureus is able to ferment the mannitol. The fermentation products are acidic, and this reduces the pH of the agar, and which turns it yellow here. So you can tell Staphylococcus aureus from other Staphylococci, like Staphylococcus epidermidis, which leaves the agar red. Now in Baird Parker, the reduction of tellurite will give a black precipitate, so the colonies turn black. So this is really just telling you, okay, the bacteria are resistant to tellurite. And the second uh, differential indicator is egg yolk, which is introduced in the medium. And this is going to tell you whether the bacteria secrete a lecithinase activity. And if so, then the lecithin from the egg yolk will become clear. So what you see on a bed parker is colonies like this. So you have a black colony with a clear halo. And these are Staphylococcus aureus. And finally, in McConkie agar, Okay, it works a little bit like Chapman, so you've got some kind of sugar, which in this case is lactose, and the bacteria which can ferment lactose are going to give colonies that are a different color because I think this is neutral red, which is uh, in, the, uh, in the medium here. And so you can differentiate 
bacteria that ferment lactose and those that don't ferment lactose because of the color of the colony. So, okay, on McConkie agar, bacteria that are lactose positive give a pink colony, and those that are lactose negative give you know, light brown, white, non-colored colonies. So this is going to tell you whether you have coliforms. That's the definition of coliforms is non-fastidious gram-negative rods that can ferment lactose. Okay, so here's a question for you about uh, different types of culture medium. So SS medium, which really exists, contains these different components. What are the terms? that you can use to describe this medium. Okay, is everybody ready to answer? Okay, who's not ready to answer? Okay, so this is a defined medium. Who says yes? Okay, no, nobody. It's a complex medium. Who says yes? Yeah, you're right, it's complex. So you've got these like peptones, meat extract, complex mixture, not really chemically defined. Okay, correct. It's selective for salmonella. Who says yes? Nobody. It's differential for gram negative. Who says yes? Nobody. It's selective for gram negative. Who says yes? Some people, most people. It's differential for salmonella. Who says yes? Okay, yeah, most people got that. Okay, so yeah, it's complex medium, differential for salmonella because it gives you a different colony morphology depending on what or color, rather, whether it's salmonella or, or not. But it is also selective for gram negative because you have these bile salts here, okay? It's exactly the same thing as we said for McConkie broth. The bile salts inhibit the growth of gram positives. So SS agar is also selective for gram negatives, differential for salmonella and shigella. This is the name, this is why it's got the, that, that name. Why is it differential for shigella and uh, Salmonella, well, it's also got, you know, lactose, and it's not specified here, but it's also got the same kind of um, uh, chemical indicator as in McConkie broth, as McConkie agar. So, gram negatives that ferment lactose will give you pink colony. Gram negatives that can uh, reduce. Okay, oh yeah, okay. Uh, okay, the, 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 the black color here, why is, where is that coming from? Okay, Shigella, they don't put, they, they, they give clear colonies, they, they don't ferment lactose. Okay, so this is the defining characteristic here. This comes from the absence of lactose fermentation. 
So why do salmonella give the black colonies? Well, it's to do with the iron and the thiosulfate. And so salmonella can use thiosulfate as an electron acceptor. So this is going to produce sulfide, and the sulfide will react with the iron. So it gives you iron sulfide, which precipitates it black. So this is the biochemical characteristic of salmonella. It's being used as the kind of the, the criterion for identifying this bacterium. Okay. Right. Bacterial growth. It's about 25 minutes for this. Yeah, that's about right. So, okay, now we can use medium to grow bacteria up. And, of course, the basis for any science is quantification. Quantitative measurements are absolutely essential if you want to have any kind of scientific reasoning. So we need a technique to allow us to measure how many bacteria we have in a given sample. And the big classic is, uh, you know, uh, counting bacteria by uh, spreading them out on agar plates. So we'll start out with our sample and perform a series, a dilution series, and then spread out a certain amount. Like here it's like one ml on uh, an agar plate. Put the plates in the incubator to grow. And then after a certain amount of time, overnight, two days perhaps, three days, you'll see colonies form on the agar. So one colony corresponds to one live bacterium that was in the sample. So initially, one bacterium is going to fall here on the agar. Then it's going to grow. So it's going to double to two, then to four, then to eight. And then eventually, you'll have enough bacteria all in the same place to see them. That's one colony. So you count how many colonies you have on the plate. You multiply it by the dilution factor, and that will tell you how many colony forming units you have per ml in the original sample. And one colony forming unit is one live bacteria, basically. So the other way to measure, so you're going to do this in the, in the lab. So the other way to measure the number of bacteria in a sample is just to measure the turbidity of the sample. So you put it in a spectrophotometer using uh, like, what, 600 nanometers wavelength. So if you have a clear solution, all that light will pass through. 100% transmission, so your optical density is zero. However, if you have particles floating in suspension, like bacterial cells, then these bacteria will disperse the light and you'll have less than 100% transmission, so you'll have an optical density some of, a, you know, positive uh, in, in the sample. So you can measure the optical density at 600 nanometers, and this will give you a measurement of the total number of bacterial cells in the sample. But they could be alive or they could be dead. So once you've got your technique for quantifying bacteria, then you can start studying their growth. So in a typical kind of experiment, what you can do is take a, a flask with a 100 ml of a complex rich medium, put in one ml of bacteria, start it shaking, take samples at different time points, and measure the number of bacteria you have by uh, dilution and plate counts. So the number of live bacteria 
in the culture as a function of time. And in very many cases, the curve that you'll get will have this kind of shape. So you start out with a latent period. You put the bacteria in, but the number of live bacteria doesn't change for a short time. It stays constant. So this is the, the lag phase. What is happening here is that uh, it may take time for the bacteria to adapt to the new medium. If they've been grown on a very rich medium before, then you put them into a defined medium, which is very poor, then they'll, take, they'll need time to produce enzymes to make the different components that are not necessarily present in the medium you've used for this experiment. That's one reason why there may be a lag phase. The second reason is that if you take bacteria from an old culture that's been going overnight or colonies that have been left on a plate for one week in the fridge, then in fact the bacteria may have reverted to a kind of a less metabolically active state and they're not really ready to grow. Okay? So then, of course, you know, they'll need to adjust to their new physiological conditions, break down their cell wall a little bit, start expressing autolysin so that they can actually grow in size and start to divide. And this also takes time. Okay, so that's the lag phase. However, once they start to grow, then you have the exponential phase. So during this phase, you know, bacteria are doubling in number every 30 minutes or every hour or something like that. So you have exponential growth. And after a while in a closed system, these exponentially growing bacteria will use up, well, perhaps use up all the nutrients. Nutrients, French word really, isn't it? Um, what would you say for that? Uh, well, I don't know. All of the goodies, all of the glucose, all of the peptones in the medium, they might not have enough to carry on growing. Bacteria can also produce toxic products from their metabolism. So if they are fermenting glucose, very often the fermentation products are acidic. So if the pH goes down too much, this can inhibit further growth. And this is what leads to the stationary phase. So the bacteria are still alive here, but they're not dividing anymore. Okay. So for most bacteria that you use perhaps in a, in a lab, the stationary phase will be when they're about you know, a billion, one times 10 to the 9 per ml. About 10 times more than is illustrated on, on the slide. Now during the stationary phase, bacteria will start to uh, you know, uh, make the cell wall more resilient and will express what are called starvation proteins, they, which can include chaperones, which can prevent proteins from, from being denatured and help them uh, uh, refold when, uh, when, they, when they are damaged. So it's kind of like they're adapting to a period of time when they're not going to have many nutrients. Okay, so the proteins you have, you know you're not going to be able to make any more. So you better be able to repair the ones you have and maintain them in a functional state. So they adapt to these starvation conditions. And this, and this allows them to survive uh, in, you know, for a couple of hours more. But it doesn't last forever. Okay. So despite these adaptations, if you carry on culturing bacteria in a closed system, then they'll begin to die. So later on, you get the death phase, where you have fewer and fewer uh, CFU counts per ml in the culture. Now, one of the uh, <laughs> I know, philosophical questions here all right, is, uh, what does it mean for bacterium to die? And 
So that's the philosophical side of it, but the, it, it's really a technical question. Okay? The, the, the philosophical question is, okay, how, how, how do we know these bacteria are really dead? We're calling them dead because they won't grow on a Petri dish. They won't grow on a normal culture medium. But maybe they kind of transition to a phase where they can't be cultivated. So this is, well, I think it began as a concept. It began as a kind of question, but now it's certainly a verified observation that during what is called the death phase, many bacteria become viable but non-culturable. Okay? So viable but non-culturable are not necessarily dead. Okay? So this slide here is, or this uh, graph here is trying to show the difference between culturable cells. This is what you get by counting the number of colonies on an agar plate during the death phase. It's going to go down, and in the end, you have no more live cells that can form colonies in the culture. However, if you look at these cells, one of the things that used to be said okay, in microbiology classes is, uh, during this death phase, bacteria are lysing and uh, they, they die. But if you look at the culture, many of the cells actually are intact. They're not like exploded. So these viable but non-culturable cells, they've got a, an intact cell wall with peptidoglycan, the, so the membrane is intact, and they have detectable metabolic activity. And you can actually count these cells. So the number of viable but non-culturable cells will go down a little bit, but stays quite high for a much longer period than the number of culturable cells that you can count on an agar plate. So what seems to be the case is that this viable but non-culturable state is kind of dormant state for these bacteria. And uh, it's a way of surviving for a prolonged period of time, poor conditions for growth. So especially for gram negatives, for example, gram negatives don't form endospores. But the viable but non-culturable state is the way they adapt to poor growth conditions. Okay? Now, that only makes sense if you can reactivate at some later point. So one of the things that people are trying to find out now is what are the right conditions to reactivate growth. So just putting them in a rich culture medium isn't enough because they're non-culturable, right? So they need something else. But many bacteria have been tested for this viable but non-culturable state. So there are you know, more than 80 different spe bacterial species where it's been described. And for some of them, it's been possible to reactivate them. And sometimes, viable but non-culturable bacteria can give pathological infections in animals, in animal models. So this is kind of a, a, an ongoing question in the food industry. Are viable but non-cultural bacteria dangerous if they're in a lot of hamburger meat, for example? If you've got viable but non-cultural salmonella, is that a problem? Are they potentially able to give, uh, start an infection? I don't think there's any data to, to, to show that, yes, they really are dangerous, but I think it's a bit of an open question. And it's a real technical question for uh, laboratories that do this kind of testing, because currently the reference methods are all based on culture. Okay, you'll get your hamburger, you'll grind it up, dilute it, and spread it out on some agar plates and count the, types of bac the number and the types of bacteria that grow. But if you've got viable but non-culturable bacteria, you'll get a negative result, even though you might have something dangerous there. So th this is a real problem. OK, we'll, we have like uh, 10 minutes to go. So I suggest we'll carry on for a little bit, OK? Just do this next part. 
and then have a break afterwards because the next part is not really fun and I don't want to come back and start with it. So the next part is growth rates of bacteria. So once bacteria are in this exponential phase, they're doubling for once every 30 minutes, once every hour, something like that. And this is something that you might want to measure. Okay. So what you have to do is firstly identify the exponential phase in the growth curve. And it's much easier to do this if you plot the number of bacteria on a log scale than if you plot them on a linear scale. Because in this linear scale, it's difficult to know when my exponential phase begins and when it ends. On a log scale, you can easily see that. And then the next thing you want to do is find out how long it takes for the bacteria to double in number, the doubling time or the generation time. So what you'll do is you'll take two measurements of the number of bacteria present at time 0 and time t during the exponential phase and apply this equation. That is the number of bacteria that we find at time t equals the number that were present at time 0 multiplied by 2 to the power of n, where n is the number of generations. Okay, so if you've had zero generations, two to the zero is one, so you've got the same number. If you have one generation, you have twice as many. Two generations, four times as many, and so on. So what you want to do is find out what, okay, you know what t is, and know, you know the time difference between the two points. You just want to find n, how many generations have occurred between those two time points. So you want to uh, resolve this equation to find n. First, you're going to take the logs of these numbers. And the reason why you need to do this is because once you do that, then you can move this n, 2 to the power of n. You can put it out down to the front of the log. Okay, That's the way logarithms work. They're like that. Okay, So you bring this n over here. And once you've done that, it's pretty easy to rearrange this. Take off log n0, put it over here, and then divide everybody by log 2. It gives you this. Okay, you know this, you know this, you know this. So you can calculate the number of generations that have occurred between these two time points. Then, in order to find the generation time, you've got to divide the time that you've run the observation by the number of generations. Okay? And that will tell you the, no, the time required for one bacterium to divide in two in a culture during the exponential phase. So the kind of numbers you get for bacteria are like this. So Escherichia coli, Staphylococcus aureus, the ones that people use in a lab, they'll be dividing once every 20 minutes or once every 30 minutes. And these are the optimal growth rate, the absolute maximum that you can, uh, uh, you, you can observe if everything is perfect, enough sugar, enough oxygen, the right temperature, and so on, the right pH. However, you know, some pathogens grow much more slowly, like mycobacterium tuberculosis will double once every 12 hours. So for these guys, E. coli, Staphylococcus aureus, they're much easier to work with. You put the culture on, the next day you'll have plenty of bacteria. If you want to work in a tuberculosis lab, everything takes a longer time. Okay. And the same is true for a lot of these bacteria, which are autotrophs. Okay. Anabina, this is a cyanobacteria, photolithoautotroph, nitrosomonas, chemolithoautotroph. So these doubling times are 12 hours, 7 hours, 
and that's the maximum, okay? That's the optimum, you know, on the probable, probably most, most uh, laboratory conditions, they'll be doubling once every day, or on this one once every 12 hours or so. So experiments on these type of bacteria will take longer. So think about the one we ended with last time. I mean, the doubling time was, what, 30 days or something, or 14 to 20 days just to double once. So some bacteria can grow really, really slowly. Okay. Um, so what I think I'll do is just leave you with this question now, okay? And we can have a break here and come back in 15 minutes, having thought deeply about this question, okay? Biochemically, how can we tell the difference between dead bacteria and viable but non-cultivable bacteria? You know, use your imaginations, talk amongst yourselves, try and find some kind of experiment. Or, you know, use an internet search if you want, you know, don't just, uh, if, you, if you have no ideas, try and find something out about this. So when we come back in 15 minutes, we'll talk about this, okay?